Did, did, okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so admittedly, this being my first sermon, I'm going to rely heavily on my notes. Um, so if I'm not as engaging as you're used to, try to listen to the words and just try to take notes yourself. Oh, Peter, you doing okay? Okay. <laughs> okay, so to start off, I want to bring up a story. Um, I want to talk about John Newton real quick. And uh, John Newton was this man born in, uh, or he was born in England in 1725, 18th century. He was a commoner. He was just a regular person growing up in a regular middle class family. England at the time was probably one of the more tranquil places to live in the world. But at the time, the world was gripped with a great immorality that many nations depended on for economic prosperity. Um, the immorality was the African slave trade. Um, John Newton grew up with a mother who was a, a devout Christian who taught him the Bible until John was age seven. Um, when uh, he was age seven, his mother died tragically. And John, all he had left with his, was his father, who was less enthusiastic about Christianity and more interested in getting John um, to be a, um, a really strong man, someone who, who would have a great life and a great success story. Um, so he enlisted John to be an apprentice on a, a Navy ship at the age of 11, and he served on many voyages. And this would start John on a life path dedicated to the sea. When John became older, he ran into trouble, one time being caught deserting <clears throat> and having to serve as a prisoner and slave even for different captains and masters who did not treat him well. Along the way, John was convinced of a more secular and atheistic worldview. He had rejected the Bible lessons his mother taught him at a young age. God was not real in his heart. Belief in God was considered foolishness to his, this enlightened John who could not stop running into harm's way. John eventually made his way to be a servant on a slave ship. He recounted this season in his life later when he wrote, I made it my study to tempt and seduce others. Eventually, John was transferred to the service of a ship called the Greyhound. This was in the year 1747. In that time, he started reading Thomas Kempis's The Imitation of Christ and was struck by a line about the uncertain continuance of life. He also recalled a passage in Proverbs, because I have called and ye have refused, I will laugh at your calamity. Well, the ship was at sea, a phenomenal and great storm hit, causing John Newton to cry out to God for rescue. This was the moment that Newton turned back from his free-thinking secular worldview and accepted the Christian worldview that he had adopted when he was very young. He later wrote, I cannot consider myself to have been a believer in the full sense of the word. Later, Newton served as a mate and then captain of a number of slave ships hoping as a Christian to restrain the worst excesses of the slave trade, promoting the life of God in the soul of both his crew and his African cargo. Later, when he retired from seafaring service, he returned to England and was inspired by the teachings of John Wesley and George Whitfield. Among this time, John realized and recognized the horrors of not only the slave trade itself, but also the actions he took part in as a slaver. John Newton was fully converted to Christ and fully opposed the practice of the slave trade and slavery in general. John Newton then became an Anglican preacher, preaching many sermons, often being very vocal about his hatred for the slave trade and the great evil against God that it was. He even wrote a book recounting the evils of the slave trade he had experienced to enlighten the commoner to the truths of its horror. He wrote multiple hymns that his congregation would sing one of them being Amazing Grace, with lyrics that were a reflection of his t personal testimony, such as, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. John Newton was an encourager, helper, and inspiration to William Wilberforce, 
a member of parliament who later successfully passed a bill through the House of Commons and the House of Lords to abolish the slave trade under British rule once and for all. John Newton was once an abuser of crewmates and slaves, a man guilty of the most atrocious and appalling crimes. He was the scum of the earth, a man nobody cared for, a man others often mistreated likewise. But somehow, by God's grace, he was turned to a passionate preacher, broken by his sin and entirely surrendered to the mercy and grace of Christ. This was a man who devoted the rest of his life to serve God and further his kingdom, and who God used as an instrument to end the African slave trade under British rule. Later in his life, John Newton wrote, Although my memory is fading, I remember two things very clearly. I am a great sinner, and Christ is a great Savior. Also, he's known to uh, have written, I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world. But still, I am not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. The text for this morning is found in the, the book of Romans, chapter 8. We will start with verse 5 and finish in verse 9. <clears throat> all right. I'll give you all a moment to get there. <laughs> Romans 8, verse 5. All right. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Let's pray. God, I just want to make, you, make myself available to you. God, I pray that you would just powerfully move in people's hearts today. God, I, I cannot speak anything outside of your word, and I cannot be effectual outside of the power of your Holy Spirit. God, teach us something today. Soften our hearts to hear what you have for us. Thank you. Amen. Okay. When looking to please and serve God, it is important to understand who the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit does. And for the sake of time, because you could literally spend hundreds of hours speaking on the Holy Spirit, I'm going to provide a brief description of who the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is God, a person in the Trinity. And if you know that God is triune, that is to say that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father, the Holy Spirit is not the Son, but the Holy Spirit is God. To really provide a snapshot of the Trinity, I explain the goals of the Trinity as the Father sends His Son to bring about the redemption of His church through the atonement of sin on the cross and raising from the dead to conquer death, after which the Father glorifies the Son. Christ did His work and all of those things to please and serve the Father who is in heaven. The Holy Spirit brings to fruition the effects of Christ's redemptive work by working and living in the hearts of God's people. So that's a brief snapshot of the Trinity and who the Holy Spirit is. When approaching the text, it is important to understand the context and the background. And we were, I will start by reading some uh, verses in Rome, Romans 7, and just hopefully you can listen to these words and get a picture of what Paul is writing here. 
Paul writes in verse 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing I do not understand. For what I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. If I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I, later on in verse 21, he says, I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God and the inner man. But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of which sin is in my members. Wretched man that I am, but thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, so then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. Paul is expressing a frustration and a celebration. He is frustrated at his sin because it is the sin he is committing is that which he does not want to do. And that is according to an, one nature, that is his flesh and the members of his body, which follow the, this law of sin and death. So there's one nature here and one law that he describes. Paul also describes that he has another nature. He has a nature of his inner being, his mind, that wants to do good and wants to please God. And that's according to the law of God. And so there's two natures and two laws that Paul introduces to us in Romans chapter 7. <clears throat> the members of Paul's body, Paul laments, seek to bring death. But Paul praises and owes a celebration that he is set free from that very death by Jesus Christ. Despite this, Paul then explains that there is a war within himself relating to two natures and two laws. So, we now move into Romans chapter 8. In verse 1, it's, Paul writes, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. What the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Paul then continues and explains that because he and other saints are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation for them. They are bound by the law of God. The law of God, Paul describes as the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, and it is a, a good law. And saints now are set free from their bondage to the law of sin and death, and are free to now oblige themselves and be, be abiding in the law of God. This does not mean that saints are now no longer able to commit sin. And on the contrary, Christians commit sin and do the very things they hate all the time. Because we are still strapped to flesh. We still have our fleshly nature that draws us, that seeks to devour us. And we will continue to live this way as long as we have life on earth. Paul is celebrating, though, because despite all of the sin that is tied to the members of his body, he faces no condemnation because of the work of Christ, the atoning work of Christ. And so, with all this, then, that's the backdrop for the text as we now start talking about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit has his role in light of what Christ did for us on the cross. So verse 5, I will just read it again. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Paul makes a powerful assertion, asserting that the mind is bound to whom that person is bound to. That is to say, he suggests the reason your mind is set one way or the other is in due to who you are according to. That is to say, 
you have an inherent nature that is bound towards either the flesh or the Holy Spirit, one or the other. A true dichotomy. Believer, your mind then is drawn naturally to the things of God because you are according to the Holy Spirit. You belong to God and your mind follows suit. This is indicative that your nature has changed completely. You've been made new in Christ by way of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit affects the work of Christ in our lives and in our hearts. And what our nature was once is now very different. If you are according to the flesh, however, unsaved and lost, you cannot set your minds on the things of the Spirit. Your mind is completely consumed by what your flesh desires, that is, what your heart desires, and that is to please and satisfy your own flesh. This is according to the law of sin and death, the law that Paul says seeks to destroy and devour. The idea of living for God is utterly ridiculous to you. You live for yourself and only to please yourself, just as your father, the devil, also does if you are in the flesh. The devil lifts, lives only to lift himself on high at the expense of everyone else, as opposed to God who lifts himself on high and brings glory to himself through the love he shows for us and the glorification of his saints. Those who are in the flesh may claim to worship other idols. They may practice other religions and they may put on an image of selflessness but all they are doing is satisfying their own flesh through their idolatry. Christianity is the only faith that exists that demands a person die to self and live for another being. Not only another being, but the highest being of all, the King of Kings, the infinite God. To have a mind according to the law of God is to have a mind set on God. To have a mind set on the flesh is to have a mind set on the self and the fleshly nature and due to it. And so then we go to verse 6. I'll just read it again. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. God who created the universe is the one who sets the standard by which to live. That is God's law. To live, you must adhere to the fullness of God's law. Because God's law is written according to what pleases him, and they are a reflection of his attributes and characteristics. God's law must be followed perfectly because God's character and all his, of his characteristics must be glorified. If there is even one failure in the area of God's law, the Bible says that you have broken God's law in every regard. Thus, since all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 However, the sins we commit are attributed to our nature from birth. That is to say, we were born from the seed of Adam, the one who brought sin into the world. And by being born of the sin of Adam, we are born spiritually dead completely completely capacitated by our flesh Psalm 51 5 David reveals that we are guilty while we were yet in the womb because we are born of the seed of Adam thus we are born not only with sin in our hearts but also we are born guaranteed to die for the mindset on the flesh is death what God created imperishable, man corrupted and made perishable through the sin that man invented. We all have sinned, therefore we all must die. And those who do not have Christ not only die, uh, can only die physically, they can live spiritually, but to those who do not have Christ, they must die spiritually as well. Since our corruption and transgressions are against an infinitely excellent and perfectly holy and infinite God, the just punishment for that crime is infinite punishment because the scope of our crime is infinite by way of whom we have offended. We have offended the infinite, perfectly holy and majestic God 
but then insert Paul's celebration in Romans 7, 25, where he says, Praise God, through Christ Jesus our Lord, that I do not face condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because of Christ's atoning work, Paul now, though guilty in the flesh, has been made alive through Christ and explains that that is the case for all believers, for all who are according to the Holy Spirit. There is life. Since Paul has been saved and is now indwelt with the Holy Spirit, he has no condemnation and his mind is now set on God. We go to verse 7 and 8. We'll just read those real quick again. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Do you understand how those of us who were once according to the flesh and were once tied to the law of sin and death how we became according to the Spirit and tied to the law of God. Paul explains that there's this gap. There's this gap in how we respond to God. Those according to the flesh are hostile towards God. Those according to the Spirit find life in God. For, for a personal example, I, I just want you to imagine what life was like before Christ. If you were raised in Christianity, it might be a little bit more difficult, but just try to picture who God was to you. Was God somebody you were just completely indifferent to? Was he somebody you were mad at? Were you angry at God? Did the idea of God fill you with anger? Just the idea of God. But now look where you are now in Christ. Where once God was somebody who was either you were indifferent to or you just had this anger and hostility towards, now you, you just get your life from seeking Him. You, you pray, you meditate on the Word, uh, you seek to draw closer to God, you want to know Him more. This gap in our response is immeasurable. So, also, if you, uh, Paul says that those who are according to the flesh are hostile towards God and cannot follow the law or please God. You can't follow the law if you're hostile towards the creator of that law. It means that you are not according to the Spirit, and if you are not according to the Spirit, you are an enemy of God. You are in enmity with the infinite God of the universe. How would you go from being an enemy to a child of God? Let's dive deeper to really get an understanding of the gap first. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says that a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. The natural man is that man who is according to the flesh. And the natural man cannot understand the things of the Spirit. That is the gospel. And that those very things are foolishness to those who are of the flesh. And so if you're in the flesh, the reason you're hostile towards God is because the things of God, like the gospel, are just completely nonsensical. It's foolishness. Let's go further. Romans 3, Romans chapter 3, verse 10 through 12, Paul writes in recounting... Uh, Scripture: There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. So then those according to the flesh cannot please God because they do not even seek for God. And they don't seek for God because they do not understand. Remember 1 Corinthians 2.14 when it says those things are spiritually appraised. Out of this lack of understanding, this passage says all have turned aside from God. 
with us, that turning aside from God is that hostility. We are naturally hostile to God because we are completely turned. We are completely um, opposite of where God is. And believers, such were all of us. Such were all of us. We were all hostile towards God from birth. So how did we become children of God according to the Holy Spirit? Well, for one thing, we had to hear the gospel. Then we had to understand the gospel. Then we had to stop being hostile towards God as we processed that gospel. Then we had to seek to further our understanding of the gospel. Then we had to seek God. And amid that, upon the completion of all those things, we had to do something unfathomable. We had to do something that pleased God. We had to put our faith in Christ. We put our faith in Christ, not just in the sense that we believed that Jesus was a real person, but that we put our trust in him and we said, God, my life is yours now. That's unthinkable. We pleased God and became children of God, according to the Holy Spirit. But how can this be? I, when I just read these passages, it says, the natural man cannot understand the things of the Spirit of God. It's foolishness. To those according to the flesh, they are hostile towards God, and they don't understand the things of God. If all fail and have turned aside to God, and nobody even seeks for God, how did we do all of that? Paul makes it clear we understood and we dropped our hostility because of the power of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit alone. Only those who are according to the Spirit is the gospel understandable. You see, the gospel message on its own is weak, ineffective, useless even, because those that hear it as natural men will not accept it and think it foolishness. But praise God that the Holy Spirit removed the scales from our eyes softened our hearts and appraised those things which are spiritual to the men of the flesh and put us in a position to please God by granting us and bestowing faith in God. Faith comes from Christ alone. For Philippians 1.29, this is a powerful verse that Paul is writing to a church of believers where he says, For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in Him but also to suffer for His sake. 2 Timothy 1, verse 8 through 9 says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which are granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. And finally, 1 Corinthians 1, 18 says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. We must know that when we preach the gospel and we witness to our neighbors, that the gospel is given its power and effectiveness by the Holy Spirit to powerfully change the natural man of the flesh and turn him into a child of God. We go to verse 9 then, where it says, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Because you have been given the Holy Spirit to indwell inside of you, Paul calls this the Spirit of Christ. The passage indicates that we are now a pleasure to God by nature. You inherently as a person cannot be more pleasing to God than you already are. God looks upon you. The Father looks down on you and sees what His Son has redeemed and whom the Spirit now indwells. You are pleasing to God. You can't earn pleasing God more. God is just pleased with you because you are His child. <clears throat> We who are now according to the Spirit and have the Spirit indwelling are now given the freedom in Christ to do that which is pleasing to Him. While before we were in bondage to do only what was displeasing to Him. You know, I hear the term freedom in Christ misused all the time because 
I, I feel like we use that and people use that sometimes to say, well, we can do kind of whatever we want, but not really, but actually that's what I'm saying to you is we can do whatever we want, but we have freedom in Christ because, you know, I'm a Christian. No, what freedom in Christ means is we are freed to now please God where before we weren't. We were in bondage to the law of sin and death. We have now been freed to serve the law of God. With this gift in, with, of freedom in Christ, comes with res- it comes with responsibility. We must now actively engage in that freedom by striving to do what is pleasing to God. Since we still have the two natures, we are still prone to do the things we hate, and we must strive for that which is according to Christ's nature and character. And that's the doctrine. I will now transition to application. So now that we have a general grasp of who the Holy Spirit is and who we are as both natural beings and born again human beings, I have three points of application. If you are hearing this message and know it to be true, and you have not been truly saved and redeemed by the blood of Christ, but have just sort of coexisted with Christianity because you go to church on Sunday and, you know, that's a good thing to do. And then, you know, hopefully I can go watch the football game. You know, hopefully the sermon doesn't run too long. (laughs) If, If that's all Christianity is to you. But now you are hearing this message and you know the gospel to be truth. Do not reject and restrict this calling any further. Know that today is a day of mercy. If you know you are truly a sinner and that you are in desperate need of the Holy Spirit and you have not repented and looked to Christ for life, right now be reconciled to God. Look to Christ as the Lord of your life and call upon the name of Jesus in your belief and be saved. Jesus is ready to forgive and ready to accept those who will look to him. Die to your sin. Die to your way of living. Give the throne of your heart to the true good king, the king of kings. If you know the gospel is true, and you know this teaching is true, then the Holy Spirit has already been working on your heart. Do not resist him. Look to Christ, and the Holy Spirit will bless you abundantly. He will bring to fruition the work of Christ, who died for your redemption in your heart. Hallelujah. Just look to him. There's no sinner's prayer that can save you. There's no, the sinner's prayer is a myth. Just look to Christ and your belief. My life is yours. My life is yours. Application number two. Believer, if you have been saved, you now know that you've been saved only because of the mercy and the work of Christ and the Holy Spirit who made that work effectual in your hearts. Since that is true, and since you have been saved by the power of God alone, then why do you try to live as under God by your own strength? We must be totally and utterly dependent on the power of God to be made righteous and to be made closer in relationship to God. When you seek obedience, seek first God in all your ways. When you seek to evangelize the lost neighbor or that friend or that coworker, and you plan on sharing the gospel with them, first cry out to God to save that person through the gospel. Remember first the one who redeemed you and who showed you unimaginable compassion towards you. There's a Christian who lived a really long time ago in the 300s and the 400s AD. His name was Augustine. He was a saint that the Lord used powerfully for kingdom work and for instruction to saints to this day. One of his famous prayer was, O Lord my God, my soul hope, help me to believe and never to cease seeking you. Grant that I may always ardently seek out your countenance. Give me the strength to seek you, for you help me to find you, and you have more and more given me the hope of finding you. Another uh, prayer that he uttered started with the phrase simply, Lord, make me good. Augustine was completely dependent on the power of God for his own righteousness. He understood that he himself was completely inadequate and can do nothing. 
apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. Augustine was famous most for his prayers, and these prayers reveal a total dependency on God. This is the heart that we should strive for as Christians. We should have a heart that says, God, I can do nothing. I'm making myself available to you. Have your way with me, Lord. God, make me good. What would you have me do today? Holy Spirit, lead me, guide me. In serving and striving to please God, we are also giving, given instruction. If Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 says, Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is a command statement. It reveals that though we have the mind of Christ, we can stray. If we do not actively seek out the Holy Spirit in our lives, and instead seek to fulfill ourselves with the things of our flesh and the things of our old nature, we will reap the things of the flesh, and we will reap sin, the things that are not pleasing to God. When we earnestly pray and engage our mind to actively search for the leading and guidance of the Holy Spirit, He will always provide. Jesus, in instructing His disciples to pray in Luke chapter 11, this is the one, th these are the two verses that everybody knows and cites. He says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. But Jesus finishes that discussion and concludes with verse 13, where he, he says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of Him? This is an instruction by Christ, not just to those seeking salvation, but to believers, that we are to be seeking God and to have our needs fulfilled by God through the Holy Spirit. So we must pray for the Holy Spirit to guide us and fill us every day. When it comes to sin, when is the last time you prayed for God to help you kill your sin? Have you done it earnestly and truly, or sort of flippantly, as if it was a, a box to check? I prayed, you know, God, help me to be a little bit better at my stuff. It's like, okay, move on with my day. When have you earnestly sought the Lord and the Holy Spirit to cleanse you, the only one who can? When you ignore sin in your life and you neglect to seek God to help you in your sin, you are saying to God, God, you are not enough to fill my needs. God, your salvation for me is unappreciated. Your compassion and love for me are secondary to what my flesh wants. If you want to be rid of sin in your life, pray like your life depends on it. Because in this, you will realize that your relationship with God will be strengthened and your holiness will improve and increase because of the powerful work of the Holy Spirit. When we sin, God also instructs us to draw near to Him all the more and confess our sins in Him for, uh, in an action of repentance. And if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That's in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. In short, the biggest point of application for this message is live your life on your knees, totally and utterly dependent on God. And God, who is faithful to bring you salvation, will be faithful to answer your prayers always. So pray with confidence Pray with dependence that when we pray for God to help lead us, make us more righteous, make us good, Christ will answer our prayers. When I have backslidden in the past, um, I don't think you have to guess what my mind was set on. It was set on the things of the flesh. And in my irresponsibility and my carelessness, I start my day oftentimes not focused on God. And that's where the draw and the temptation of the flesh is strongest. But to invite the Holy Spirit to kill sin, if you soak your mind on the Word of God, 
if you soak your mind on the things of the Spirit, then the temptations by the flesh are diminished automatically. You're, you're being filled and satisfied in your heart by God when you seek to commune with Him, to start your day and throughout your day. And as you do that, you'll just find that temptation to do wrong is not as strong. What good is temptation and what good is the flesh compared to God and His fulfillment and His presence in our lives? Thus we read God's Word not just to improve our head knowledge, but also to invite closer communion with God. To invite the Holy Spirit to draw our mind to follow His lead. To allow Him to make us holy. We invite the Spirit of God by reading the Word of God. Those are application notes. I will now finish the message by talking about um, a characteristic of the Christian that is important to understand, and then a final note. The scriptures tell us that Christ was well acquainted with sorrow and grief, as in Isaiah 53, verse 3. Likewise, we ourselves, Christian, if you live in this world, it is a grieving to live in this world. There will be an inherent and natural grieving that must take place in our hearts just to live in this world. The reason for this grief is because we cannot have perfect communion with God in this life. The communion we have with God will always be fed through a filter of this broken world, the frustrations that we find through it. We may seek out God as often as we can, but distractions and trouble will find us. Do you ever just go through your day, Christian, as if you're dragging double your own weight behind you, like a ball and chain? Family drama, relationship turmoil, tragic events, loss, our sin, all these things will cause grief and distract us from communion with God. And may I suggest to you that when you are grieved and troubled, the real reason for that grief is your communion with God, which can be so rich when you are seeking Him, is broken. It is impossible to not be distracted, and it's impossible to not be troubled if you live in this world. Christ promised it. Take heart, though, that though we cannot have perfect intimacy with Christ, He knows and understands. So in those short, meaningful times every day where we can actually find communion with God and seek out our relationship with Him, take joy in the fact that when we leave this world, we will enter the communion with God without distraction, without trouble or doubt. Every suffering gone, every tear wiped away, we will have intimacy with our King of Kings for all eternity. Never lose sight of the promise of our glorification, our eternity with God that awaits us. We will always be satisfied in God because of His grace. And one final note. Though through all these things that grieve us, let us be encouraged. This is not our home. We are aliens living in a foreign land. Our destiny lies in paradise. We will spend eternity in the intimate presence of God. We can enjoy the love God has for us. We can enjoy the... Um, the infinite mercy and holiness and majesty of the King of Kings. Those characteristics of God de demand a praise infinite in scope as well, and we will have all the time to levy that praise. This is the very King who looked down on us while we were yet sinners, who were hostile towards God, and He died for us. God loves His children more than you could ever fully know. But we have all eternity to try and figure that out. Until that time when we should be glorified, as we strive through this corrupted world, let us give all the glory and honor and praise to God in our lives as long as we draw breath. All right. I'm going to end in prayer. God, I just pray that you would encourage us to, to seek you more in our daily lives. God, to take encouragement that, that we are already a pleasure to you, that we do not have to be more of a pleasure to you than we already are, 
but that, God, we, we want to strive and seek to grow closer to you and to have a stronger relationship with you and to please you more. God, I pray you would help us. God, I would pray you to help us preach the gospel and that you would work powerfully through that. I pray you would help us conquer sin because we cannot do it on our own. God, I, th I thank you for your many blessings in this time you've given us to commune together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.